Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Get Attention, Get Results, Get Presentable. Brought to you by NUS Enterprise and A Start Central. I am Jai from NUS Enterprise, and together with me is Susan from A Start Central, and we will be your host for today. A Start Central is an open innovation platform by A Start. Where we inspire, innovate with, and empower researcher entrepreneurs in building successful deep technology-enabled ventures. In this enterprise, is the entrepreneur arm of the National University of Singapore, where we play a pivotal role in advancing innovation and supporting entrepreneurial journeys. In this marketing workshop today, we share with you a toolkit we call Presentable. We hope it will help deep tech startups to achieve their goals faster by connecting deeper with the customers, investors, partners, and talent. A couple of house rules before we start. If you have questions during the panel discussion, do type your questions in the Q and A feature down below. We will take questions during the Q and A segment. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our special guest and trainer, Hugh Mason. Hugh is an entrepreneur with thirty years of success leading ventures and building innovation communities around startups and corporations. He is a co-founder at Remission Health and an associate professor at. And US, since two thousand two, Hugh has co-founded, mentored, and invested in more than seventy startup companies. As the co-founder of JFDI dot Asia, the first business accelerator in Southeast Asia, Hugh has supported thousands of startup founders through its outreach programs. It's yours, Hugh. Thanks. Thanks very much, and hello everybody. It's a real pleasure to join you today. Um, I hope you can all see see me and hear me cor correctly. Um, are you getting me through clearly, Susan? You hear my sound? Yes, we can hear you now. Very good, excellent. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I've got a presentation for you that should take something like an hour. Um, during it, I'd be really grateful if you could pop questions into the Q and A section here on on the on the, that function. We'll try and in the chat, we'll try and deal with those um, as we go through or at the end, that seems most appropriate. I think Susan's going to kind of collate those, um, and you can upvote them apparently. So please do use that feature. Um, I love to have questions. I love to have a, a sense that there's an audience out there. So um, let's let's try and keep this as live as we can. Okay, let's jump in. Um, I have put together some slides here with the idea that we start off basically by thinking about you know, why everyone might be here. One of the keys to marketing is to understand your audience, who you're trying to connect with. And I think there are a number of different agendas for this meeting. If you've been following the news, um, there's a huge strategic priority here in Singapore to get innovation right. Um, some of you may know that I had COVID-19 earlier this year in March. I was in um, SGH, very grateful to MOH for getting me, getting me well again. I think around that time, um, there was discussion in, in government about you know, what the priorities should be for the sort of COVID-19 world. And I, I wondered, I must admit, if we were gonna kind of focus in on the sort of traditional stuff around real estate and um, things like that. And what's actually happened is that government here in Singapore has really made a huge priority about, about deep technology, about innovation, exactly the stuff that we're doing. So I think that gives us a kind of a challenge. And, I'll let you into a secret. We, we tried an experiment in marketing this webinar. We actually put out two different messages. One was a mo message that was sort of leveraging off this, uh, uh, this message from, from um, Deputy Prime Minister here about hope, really. And it was saying, you know, would people like to come along to this seminar in order to find out how to get faster to money? Uh, is it about getting faster to the future? But we also picked up on another feeling about innovation, which is that deep technology is risky, that it takes a long time, um, and that uh, it's a challenge to get there. Um, if some of you saw that EDM that came to you, you'll have seen this list of factors for startup failure. I find it very interesting that when you look at some of the reasons why startups fail, so many of them are related to marketing. So it seemed very important to us that, that we, we, we help people move forward in terms of raising money and, and getting customers and have achieving success, but also that we try to reduce those failures. Um, this is one of really a series of sessions that we're planning to run. What I'm trying to do in this section, this session is to give an overview of what I've learned about marketing over something like 30 years of being an entrepreneur and working with probably 500 different businesses now um, in that period. And there's a sort of takeaway from it. From anyone who's interested to follow up, I think uh, Susan and CI are going to send through to you a template for a marketing action plan, something that you can have a go at in your own time. If you send that back to us, then what we'll try and do is collate people together into groups. 
so that there's no competitive kind of issues and try and pick up on the issues that are emerging and run some further sessions. So this is the beginning of a series of, of sessions really. What unites us all, even though there will be differences in the audience, is that we're all in this business of innovation. And I'm sure some of you have seen this picture before. It's sometimes called the innovation trifecta. The idea that in order for an innovation to succeed, it has to do three things at the same time. I mean, it has to be feasible, it has to technically work. Right? Otherwise, it's science fiction. Right? It has to be viable, it's got to generate value for somebody. That isn't necessarily financial value, it could be that you're achieving impact, but it does need to generate value. And then thirdly, and this is the one that tends to be in a funny sort of way, the most challenging thing is it's got to be desired by multiple stakeholders. Anybody who could get in the way of stopping the innovation succeeding probably will. So how do you get to that central point? That's the central challenge of all innovation. And what I'm gonna do is to try and use this model for the purposes of this discussion anyway, and to try and sort of define marketing. And I'm gonna say that when we're doing deep technology, we're fundamentally pushing in this area. We're looking at the boundaries of what's feasible. Um, and when we're doing marketing, I think we could say for the purposes of this session, it's all the rest of it, everything else that goes into making innovation successful. Now, I'll tell you in a moment, I don't come from a business school background. Um, I teach in the Faculty of Engineering where we take a very pragmatic view at, at NUS. Um, probably there are business school professors who may be watching here who will be horrified by this as a definition of marketing. So I'm just going to use this as a, as a, as a working kind of um, uh, uh, definition for the purposes of this presentation only. Thank you. Sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, could you speak a bit slower? Yes, certainly. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so anyone who's been a founder of a startup, I think will recognize this sort of picture. Time runs from left to right in this picture. Happy is upwards and sad is downwards. We come together on a new venture. We think that it's all going to be successful. Uh, we're full of energy, we're full of enthusiasm. There is this peak of anticipation. And then actually, of course, it turns out to be a lot harder than we thought. There's this period that many startup entrepreneurs call the trough of sorrow. When you're trying to get things to work, the technology doesn't work, customers aren't interested, nobody seems to care. There is a point when it starts working, and then there's a miraculous moment when we call product market fit, when you have something that the market actually wants. And that's when the business can actually start scaling. So I wanted to use this picture to say, if anyone here watching this recognizes this, we can sort of see two zones in here. There's a kind of startup zone when you're figuring out what the market wants and what you're going to offer it. And then there's a kind of a scale up zone. And the moment when one changes into the other is this sort of is a region really when product market fit is happening. Right? And what I'm going to suggest to you is that marketing is different in those two sections of a, of a business's life. At the beginning of the life of a business, it's really all about discovering what's possible discovering what the market wants, and discovering how you can create value. So going back to those three things in the innovation trifecta, it's about trying to find your way to that sweet spot in the middle. Once you've got product market fit, it's then about building the business as fast as you can, as, as, to as large a size as you possibly can, to make the most impact in however way you measure impact. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that marketing is quite profoundly different in those two halves of this picture. So let's have a look at who's on the call. Um, we had some interesting information. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, who collated together a load of data. I'm not sure whether this represents exactly who's on the call at the moment, but this was the kind of mix of people we had. Um, so I hope that, that most people listening somehow fit into that kind of a picture because that's what I've designed the presentation for. There's another sort of insight I wanted to share with you, which is that Bernadette Barr and I, my, my colleague Bernard and I, did a, a rough and ready survey. I don't pretend that this is a piece of authentic uh, peer reviewed research, but we did do a study into some of the challenges faced by deep technology startups here in Singapore. And I thought it was rather interesting that these, these issues came out and I'm wondering whether they resonate for anyone. Please do comment again in the Q&A. Does this sort of, does this feel like a summary of the issues that, you, that, that, that you're facing? So a lot of startups and scale up say, you know, there's a challenge between working on the technology and getting that right, and at the same time trying to build a business, both of those things are very difficult. Where do you put your energy? And I'll come back later in the presentation to talk about how I think that probably changes for successful scale-ups and startups as, as they grow. And there's a second issue, which is about just explaining the technology itself. If you're doing something which by definition has never been done before, it's really hard to explain it. 
and for people to get their heads around it. And even if you're selling something that's very, very technical to very, very technical people, they probably haven't had the chance to read the literature and get into the absolute depth of it in the same way that you have. And certainly there are going to be decision makers involved in any purchasing decision who haven't got the expertise that you've got. So we need to find a way of bridging a sort of expertise gap and a communications gap here. And then there's the, the fact that people are looking for different things out of the project. And I always think that a, you know, it takes, a, it takes a, a village to raise a child, it takes a, an ecosystem to raise a startup. Around the ecosystem of people who will support a new venture, um, there are very, very different views of what constitutes success. Um, so for the academic world, it might be about publications and precedents. Uh, for a product development team, it might be about doing something that's a beautiful piece of technology, something that's exciting, has never been done before in its own way. And for investors, it might be about money, it might also be about social impact. But there'll probably be a different agenda. Then I think there's another issue here, which is that we all think we know how to present. We all think we know how to tell our story based on our own experience. But the truth is that different communities have different expectations of how a story is most effectively told. They want different things out of what they're hearing. And that can make it extremely difficult when you've only got 30 seconds to do an elevator pitch to somebody that you don't, met, you don't know and you've just met at a conference, or perhaps six to 12 minutes if you're presenting to a group of investors for the first time. You need to make a whole series of assumptions about what people are gonna be interested in. And, and the style of presentation that worked, for example, if you were a PhD student when you were doing your Viva, that's probably not appropriate for pitching to investors. And then finally, there's a big thing that came leaping out to, to Bern and I, which was that, you know, for many of the startups and scale-ups we spoke to, there was this sense that marketing is promotion, that it's about promoting something. And as we'll see later on, promotion is part of marketing, but it's only one part of it. And I think if all you think of as marketing is that, oh, I need to sort of do the technology and then I'll stick some promotion on the top, then the business won't work. And that's probably one of the most common reasons why, why deep technology startups fail. So those were some of the issues that came out, some of the things that motivated us to want to look at this. A um, little bit about me. Um, I started my career as an engineer. Um, it's a long time since I picked up a soldering iron. I was a hardware engineer um, before I went to university working with GC Marconi, working on things like digital radar um, and synthetic aperture radar from aircraft, motion compensation, and that kind of thing. Um, I went on and did a physics degree actually um, and then later on I didn't become a, an engineer. I, I admire engineers but I'm not diligent enough to be one. Um, I realized that my, my skill if I have one is telling stories around science and technology and I actually ended up joining the BBC and when I was about 25, 26 worked on a live show that had about 10 million people watching it every week called uh, Tomorrow's World. And that was an interesting challenge because we had to explain what a new piece of technology was, why it was relevant to people's lives and, uh, and how it worked, all in about sort of a minute and a half, something like that. So I had a lot of practice at, at putting together very simple, short explanations of complicated ideas. I went on uh, to set up an investment and advisory firm. I became an entrepreneur myself. Um, and I did a master's in leading innovation and change um, because I'm very interested in how to make this stuff successful. Um, I moved to Singapore in 2009. Um, uh, some friends call me an Angmo Korean. My son went to local school. He'll do his NS when he gets to, uh, uh, to leave school. Um, we've been here over 12 years now. I live in an HDB, which I'm talking to you from now. So um, very much uh, integrated with, with things here. And it was an honor about six or seven years ago to be asked to join NUS um, as an adjunct professor. I have no PhD. Um, uh, my experience is practical from 30 years of being an entrepreneur. Um, and I still have heroes from the scientific world. I, I remember when I was trying to explain science to popular audiences, this is one of my heroes in particular, Dr. Magdi Yacoub here, some of you might know, is a, a leading heart surgeon um, uh, based in Britain. I think he's Egyptian originally, I believe. Um, Magdi Yacoub, I was filming, making a, a, a program about the blood circulation for uh, 14, 15 year olds trying to think, how can I, how can I interest 14 year olds in, in the science of blood circulation? And Dr. Magdi Yaku gave me this fantastic line. He was kind of doing his surgery like this and he looked up to the camera and he just said, I'm now going to make a hole to let the blood flow up to his head. <laughs> I kind of carried on with his surgery. And it was a fantastic way of explaining what we're actually talking about here is a real human being's life and a real human circulatory system. And I think the reason I tell you that story is because I think often when we're trying to do deep technology, we have to find touch points like that, things that will connect across 
the barriers of experience and culture and age. Um, we have to find moments where we can engage with people who are not necessarily specialists as we are. Down at the bottom is uh, uh, Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Um, some of you might know she discovered pulsars. Um, she was a great hero of mine. And up in the top left hand corner is uh, Dr. Harry Cro Croto, Sir Harry Croto actually, um, who discovered fullerenes. Um, he and actually, you know, I actually had an argument the last time I spoke to him. He's dead now, he died in 2016, but we had an argument because he wanted to spend the million dollars he'd been given for his Nobel Prize money on communicating science to the public. And I said to him, well, you need some professional science communicators. And he was saying, oh, no, I don't need that, but I'm a Nobel Prize winner, blah, 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 blah. And I thought that was interesting because it kind of illustrates this challenge. Uh, some of you may be aware of the Dunning-Kruger effect, as it's called. Um, there was a classic, fantastic paper written here in 2009 uh, that looks at the problem that experts have. You know, if you're an expert and you know something in one field, there's a tendency to assume that actually you'll be fine moving into any other field. How hard can it be? How hard can it be? And I think one of the challenges often when uh, folk who've been trained, for example, in science try to move into business is it's a very different way of thinking. And it, it can be easy without being arrogant as such to just assume that there's a bunch of things you don't need to learn and actually you do. It may not be a science, like the hard science you practice in the lab, but it is an art and an art requires practice like dancing or playing football. Business is more like that, I think. And I'm very grateful for everyone being honest in self-reporting coming into this presentation. Again, Susan kindly ran a survey. This was how people uh, rated their knowledge about marketing coming into this discussion. So most people are relatively inexperienced in marketing and that's where I've pitched this discussion to. So I hope that the more experienced people on the call will challenge me and pick up questions and clarify things in the Q&A. Uh, I'm not able to see it as we're going through this, but I do hope that there's a whole discussion starting there. Uh, around issues that I'm, uh, that I'm going to talk about. Okay, let's move into the meat of it now. And I'm going to talk very distinctly here now about those two halves of the venture journey. I'm going to talk first of all about deep tech startups, and then we'll move into talking about deep tech scale-ups and how that works. So let's talk about startups first of all specifically. So I guess we should give a definition. Um, uh, what is deep tech? I've suggested that it's pushing at the frontier of feasibility and I just want to dive into that in a bit more detail because I think it starts to reveal why there are particular problems and challenges with marketing deep tech companies. Some of you might be familiar with technology readiness level. It's a concept that I believe originates with NASA and the Department of Defense in the US. It's been in use since the 1980s and the idea is that we can kind of map where a technology is in terms of its development from absolutely pure basic science through to something that's ready to send on a satellite even if we can never maintain uh, the thing ever again in its life. Um, so for example, if I was working in a lab and I synthesized a new material and I squeezed it and discovered it created a voltage, I'd say, oh, I've discovered a new piezoelectric crystal, right? But it's gonna be a very long time before that's available and ready to use as a transducer on a nuclear submarine and um, for the defenses of a nation to depend on it, right? So there's a journey that technologies go through from basic science through to being accepted, available off the shelf, you can buy it out of a parts catalog. And that's true for every kind of innovation. Uh, you know, this, this pattern here on the back of the, I don't know quite what that's called on the back of an engine here, jet engine, someone probably knows. Um, but apparently that innovation took seven years to go from an idea in someone's head through to something that's now a feature of quite a lot of aircraft. I'm sure you've seen it if you've been to the airport in the last 10 years or so. The reason I had to go through all that testing is because the aircraft is a complex system. There are so many parts that can interact with each other. You need to make sure that you've investigated all the edge cases. And of course, that's true for something like a vaccine as well. You know, I think we all saw probably the news in the last day or so. Unfortunately, the Oxford vaccine trial has been halted because it looks like there might be some kind of um, adverse side effect uh, in that vaccine trial. Um, we need to test for all of these things. And that's the reason why every technology, whether it's jet engines or vaccines for COVID-19, they all have to go through a structured process of evaluation like that. Now, that's fine and it's important for safety. However, from an economic point of view, it does present a challenge. Now, if you're a country like Singapore and you're saying, whoa, the world's changing, um, you know, China and America seem to be pitching a trade war between them. Our traditional role is changing. Um, we've been a fantastic dormitory for multinationals. The, Ec the Economic Development Board did a brilliant job for us bringing 7,000 multinationals here over the last 50 years. 
is that going to be viable for the future? What we'd really like to do is to build a business that didn't just bring other people's uh, multinationals to Singapore, but created our own valuable technologies here. If we're going to do that, we need to kind of speed up the process. We need to make the process more robust and we need to make it more repeatable and we ideally need to make it happen faster. So a lot of the reasons for this discussion, the beginnings of a discussion today, are all about that. Now, complementing the technology readiness level concept, um, Professor Steve Blank at Stanford put through a, an idea about 2013, suggesting that you might also be able to have a kind of a investment readiness measure for startups. Do you remember that innovation trifecta I showed you earlier on where we had feasibility, desirability, and viability, commercial viability? Well, the way I think of investment readiness is it's sort of crushed down into two dimensions, what is actually a three-dimensional graph. You know, if, you have, if you think of it as three dimensions, you could plot the development of a startup on that in, in three dimensions. If you crush the dimensions of desirability and viability into one measure and you call it investment readiness, then I think you get something like the right hand side. When that measure talks about the canvas, it's talking about the business model canvas, and we'll come back to that later on in this presentation. But it describes how a business creates a sustainable, scalable way of generating value. So I'm going to take those two quantities now, investment readiness and technology readiness, and I'm going to put them on a graph, roughly speaking, here. So in fact, not really a graph, it's a, it's a set of categories, isn't it? So there are nine technology readiness levels going from completely new phenomenon through to available off the shelf. And there are nine investment readiness levels going from an idea on the back of a cigarette packet through to something that you can buy in SimLim. Okay. And every technology, starts off somewhere over here and it moves down somewhere over here. And the critical question that every innovator has to answer and the thing they have to convince other people about is that the technology should be done and that it could be done. Those two are the two fundamental questions that, 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 that come out of that innovation trifecta at the beginning. And every technology, if you think about it, makes that journey. And I remember when I was a kid, um, something like a fax machine started off in the top right hand corner you know, it was a very science, it was a very sci-fi-ish thing. I remember my dad saying he'd got this machine at work, this is in the 1970s, that could send pieces of paper from one part of the world to another part, and they just popped out instantaneously. And then, of course, fax machines became something that everybody had, and now we don't really use fax machines unless you work in a hospital. So one of the ways, I think, of getting a handle on innovation is to say that there are maybe at least three different sort of regions of innovation. And this is an idea that's been promoted by McKinsey a lot. It's, it's come from these guys, Naji and Tuff, originally. The idea that there might be three different horizons on which innovation takes place. I'm just going to pause and focus on this for kind of a minute or two because I think it's absolutely critical if you're trying to sell uh, a deep technology product into another business customer to, to get a sense of this model because it will help you understand why you're having challenges engaging with people. Most corporations sell things that they understand to people that they understand using processes that they understand. They're working in what we call horizon one. They're usually using yesterday's technology, actually, addressing the markets that they already know. And when people do what they call innovation in horizon one, this is most people in most large organizations, they want something that's absolutely zero risk. I buy it off the shelf, I procure it, I pay the money for it, and it starts delivering some benefit in my business within the next you know, quarter or at least maximum, you know, a year. I need to be able to show to my boss that if we bought this thing, there was zero risk involved and it made things better. So usually this is about reducing costs. It's about increasing efficiency. It's about that kind of thing. There is, and that kind of stuff tends to appeal to chief financial officers. It's about saving money and efficiency. This section here, Horizon 2, is the kind of thing that chief executives like to talk about. It's about building on our strengths as an existing business, adopting technology which is maturing, uh, being ahead of the com competition, but there is some risk associated with it. So down here, well, I might, for example, if I'm running a bank or a production line making batteries for laptops, I might, have, I might say I can't possibly accept any risk if I put some new chemical into my batteries in, and then it turns out that they burst into flame when people are flying with them in the air. That's going to result in huge lawsuits and, and, and it's going to destroy our brand. So I can't possibly introduce anything until it's really, really well tested. On the other hand, I might be a business that's facing competition and say, well, I need to take some risk. I need to adopt stuff before the competition does in order to stay ahead. And I also might want to open up new opportunities for the business. So I'm prepared to work in Horizon 2. 
The stuff that most of you on this call are probably involved with is up here. Um, Horizon 3, it's very risky, it's experimental. We expect to fail up here. The way that we find out what flies is to put together a prototype, let it crash and figure out what broke, fix the thing that broke, and then try flying again. It's like learning to ride a bicycle. You learn to ride a bicycle by falling off. And then whatever you did that made you fall off, you don't do that again. So we have a very different attitude to risk. It's not that we set out to fail. It's not that we set out to take risks. It's just that we understand up here that risks are necessary uh, in order to push back frontiers. Whereas down here, we can't accept risk. So they're very, very different cultures. And I think I've tried to sort of encapsulate that with some of these pictures over here you know this is say, the kind of stuff that conventional business people love to do deals around now, you're not going to be selling to large corporations until you've got something which is down in this part of the graph on the other hand when you're up in this part of the graph up here people have got all sorts of prejudices about you <clears throat> have you noticed how uh, okay scientists don't really look like this and they don't look like that either but it is interesting, isn't it, that research labs tend to be built sort of out in the countryside, away from big cities. You know, is that in case of an explosion? They tend to have underground bunkers. There's all sorts of sort of fantasies that the public has. People are not involved in deep technology about where it goes on and who does it. And those things are very alive and across many, many different cultures. And that might sound silly. It might sound comic. And of course, it is funny. If you watch Back to the Future, it is funny. But it has a big effect in terms of trying to sell deep technology into risk averse business people down here. I think that cultural gap comes about because in order to be able to do this stuff over here, you have to take quite an extraordinary journey. And this is a lovely picture put together by a guy called Matt Might. I just want to take sort of a minute or two out here for anyone who hasn't seen it. It's called the Illustrated Guide to a PhD. And I think it sums up why being a specialist makes it so challenging to connect with other people. When we're born, if this is the entire circle of human knowledge, we know absolutely nothing. We go to primary school and we start figuring out how to do some maths, how to read and write. By the time we've finished secondary school, we've got a general grounding in how the world works, but at a very shallow level. Once you choose a degree, you've got some kind of specialization. You're beginning to move in a certain direction. And of course, if you do a master's, then you can extend that. Now, if you start doing research, you push out, you read what's in the literature, you're actually, quite quickly, you'll reach the frontier of what is known. If you focus on that, and you keep banging away against that frontier for years and years and years, eventually, you might make a dent in the universe. And if you do that, you get a PhD. <laughs> and the wonderful thing about having a PhD is it means you can see what no one else has seen before. This was the privilege I had as a science filmmaker. I worked with people who'd seen smaller things, who'd seen further things, who'd looked at the world in a different way that had never been seen before. It's an enormous privilege, but it comes with a cost, which is that the rest of the world doesn't see what you see. <laughs> That's why there is a disconnect. And I think it's hard when you work in an environment that is where you're surrounded by others doing deep technology. It's very hard to appreciate just how much of a specialist you've become. So I think that's why there's some kind of disconnect. And it might start to explain why, if you put deep technology on that landscape we were looking at earlier, it might start to explain why it's such a challenge to communicate it. You know, the science is not just unfamiliar to the general public and non-specialists, it's actually unfamiliar to people in your field as well. I remember once uh, at NUS, we had a, a research team had come up with a new material for binding together the materials that go into a rechargeable battery electrode. And I said to these guys, okay, who are you gonna sell that to? And they said, oh, a battery manufacturer. So I said, well, who would that be? Uh, Samsung. And I said, well, does Samsung themselves make batteries? No, they don't. But they might have a subsidiary company that does it. Okay, so imagine you go and knock on the door of the subsidiary company that's part of Samsung's group. And you say, okay, I've got this new binder for uh, cells. It makes them charge four times quicker. And you, who are you gonna to talk to? And they said, well, maybe the CFO? chief financial officer or the CEO. And I said, do you think they'll be the decision maker? And, and actually, as we pinned it down, we decided that the really critical person they'd have to persuade to take on a technology like that would be the production director, the person who's actually responsible for that battery cell production line. Because as I was saying earlier, if they put an unfamiliar substance into a battery production line where you're making tens of thousands of batteries a day and something goes wrong, then it'll be a total disaster. So there is a real communication challenge when you come up with something that's a deep technology product 
And I think this one is a particular issue in our age. You know, it was very interesting when I was working in the BBC um, around the time that American companies like Monsanto were trying to launch genetically modified crop seeds into agriculture around the world. In Europe, there was an enormous amount of misinformation about genetic uh, modification of, of living things. And that created an enormous backlash, which not only resulted in legislation in the European Union, I think banning genetically modified crops, but it also resulted in huge uh, consumer resistance to any food product in particular that may have been made through genetic manipulation. Of course, the scientists involved said, well, we've been, you know, we've been doing selective breeding of plants for years. We've been doing <laughs> genetic engineering like that for years. We've just doing it in a new way. But in order to convey what that benefit, what the benefit of that technology, benefits of that technology might be, and to move it into an area where people felt comfortable buying it, that was an enormous challenge. And because the companies didn't manage that challenge early enough on, the technology didn't take off in Europe. It has done in the US, but not in, but not in Europe. So I think if we're trying to answer these, could it be done and should it be done questions, deep technology produces a challenge because there's a kind of a chasm between here and there. And a lot of it's to do with communication. So that's what we're gonna focus on from now on. There are, if you're a startup, a couple of different ways of dealing with the mismatch between your ideas and what the market wants. The traditional way of doing it is to, as I say, put a bunch of researchers somewhere in a remote field have them come up with lots of ideas, and then have people with suits pick the best ones in theory. Then you put together a team of engineers to turn those ideas into products, and then you hire a bunch of salespeople and you try and sell it to the world. If you're lucky, you have a success like the transistor or nylon, and it becomes a world beating product. But actually the truth is that that sort of big business Bell Labs approach to innovation doesn't work most of the time. 70, 80% of innovations done in large corporations using this kind of an innovation framework, as it's called, they fail for all sorts of reasons, which we could go into another time if people are interested or pick up in the Q&A. So more recently, people have tried another approach, um, the startup approach, which is basically to come up with an idea as quickly as possible, build a, some kind of prototype of it, start testing it, see if it starts to produce any benefits anyone's interested in, get some data back and learn from that. Of course, this is not an unfamiliar pattern. For anyone who's used to doing basic research in a lab, this is the kind of thing that you do. You do a quick and dirty experiment, get some kind of a hunch and build on it. So what you end up doing is going through an iterative process where you cycle around that loop and you might end up in a different place from where you started, but you will end up with something that people actually want and something that generates value. It just might not be what you started off with. Now, that can be a problem in a corporate world where people are very interested in investing money into research, into stuff that fits corporate objectives and strategies and so on. So traditionally, the route in the kind of corporate world or, or indeed in, in, in a lot of the research we do in the public sector uh, here in Singapore is to go through a series of stages where we prove the technology and then only at the end have a kind of go to market strategy, which is a sort of thing that's bolted on the end. In recent years, there's been more sort of rigor come into the evaluation of research proposals at these earlier stages down here, but it isn't yet um, as strong as it could be in my view. In my view, this is perhaps what we ought to be doing. We ought to be considering the investment readiness level question. We should be considering the should it be done question in much more rigor earlier on. I would even suggest that while we have a principal investigator that looks at the science, we should perhaps have a commercial investigator with equal status, which, is, uh, which, which can work with projects which are, are going to use substantial public funding. Because otherwise, we can see from the numbers that the success rate of getting to the bottom left-hand corner, what you might call the cozy corner down here, that success rate is remarkably low. The problem with doing this approach is it's very, very expensive to put millions and millions of dollars into something and then find out that actually the market doesn't want it. I want to give you a couple of, couple of case studies that illustrate this and also illustrate the limits of it. So I think about eight years ago, something like that now, um, my son was uh, what five or six years old and he saw my wife and I doing email and he wanted email, but he was far too young to have his own email account. So when I saw this app being advertised, mainly, I don't have shares in it, by the way, in case anyone's wondering, it said your kid's first email. I thought, fantastic. And I downloaded the app. And it was completely useless. <laughs> it didn't work. And it had a huge green button up in the top right hand corner at that point that you could click and, and give feedback to the developers. So I clicked the, 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 the feedback and said, guys, this is a fantastic idea. Totally crap execution. 
And within two years, two, within two hours, I'd had a message back from the developers in Spain saying, yes, we know it doesn't work. We know it's crap. We only came up with the idea on Wednesday. We launched it on Saturday. 10,000 people have downloaded the app. Now that we know that they care, in other words, that the idea should be done, now we'll figure out what to do, what could be done. Now, that's a lovely story, and it illustrates so-called lean startup methodology perfectly, I think. Of course, that's not possible. As a plastic surgeon said to me, you know, I can't do an experimental plastic surgeon's operation on aesthetic surgery on someone's face and say, I'm sorry it messed up. You know, I'll give you 10% off version 2.0 in six months' time. You know, plastic surgery is not the same as software. <laughs> so you can't do exactly this with everything. But I do think it's an interesting approach which can come into many areas of science. And I think where people don't do that, it's quite interesting to look back at what was once deep technology and say, well, what happens if you don't understand customer needs? I just want to spend a couple of minutes because I think this is an interesting story on a technology that we're already we're all familiar with, the telephone. I made a film about the origins of the telephone and I filmed with a couple of wonderful historians of technology and they told me something I'd never expected. They pointed out to me that not only did the telephone not work very well when it was first invented in 1876, in fact, it didn't really work very well for the first 10 or 15 years of its existence. You had to shout into it and the audience here had to listen very, very hard. So they would sort of, um, Alexander Graham Bell and his assistant um, uh, Watson, who would demonstrate this, would shout into the thing and they knew exactly how to hit uh, the right tone with their voice and they would sing familiar songs and things like that so that people would fill in the gaps when the technology wasn't working very well. Anyway, not only did the technology not work very well for the telephone, but it also wasn't an obvious technology. At that time, there was no intimate technology that was in your home that would allow you to communicate instantaneously with other people. Now, there were telegraph wires all around the world. Even in 1876, you could send a message in about 10 minutes from London to Australia. That was possible. But the idea that you might have a technology present in your home where people could interrupt what you were doing with a bell that rings, and then you had to go over when it suited them to answer their questions or whatever it was, and that technology could only send one message at a time down these very expensive wires stretching across America. Why would you want to do that? There was absolutely no commercial case for the telephone at first. It was an interesting curiosity, but there was no case for it. And I think it's very interesting when you look at this adoption curve here for technology, the different technologies, the telephone is the purple line. In order to get to 50% penetration of telephones took 70 years. Isn't that extraordinary? Now, we can't in Singapore invest in technologies that take decades to get to adoption, even if ultimately they become something that's in everyone's pocket. By that time, we'll be out of business. So we have to find a way of accelerating this process. And by the way, if anyone wants to pick up in the Q&A, it's you know, rather interesting, I think, why some of these more modern technologies took off so much faster. Now, we've talked about startups, and I'm going to say if anyone watching this wants support for a startup idea, I'm going to ask that Susan and TI follow through by email to give you links to some of the existing programs that are out there for startups, things like uh, the GRIP program at NUS or Entrepreneur First uh, or the programs that are there within ASTAR because startups I think we've now got fairly good provision for here in Singapore. What I wanted to spend a little bit more time on in the end of this presentation now was really on scale-ups because we have a hunch around the folk involved in setting up this session today that scale-ups are a kind of a gap and marketing for them is a particular problem. So I want to start off as I talk about scale-ups by making, I think, what kind of seems like an obvious point, which is that by the time you've got past product market fit, you're very definitely not doing a science project. You know, the technology is really important. Without it, nothing can happen. The technology makes different features, products, and services possible. That's a wonderful thing. But ultimately, customers don't buy products and services. They buy the benefits that those things offer to them. And I think that was said most clearly by Theodore Levitt here. You know, he said that absolutely nobody in the world wants a quarter inch drill. What they want is a quarter inch hole. In fact, they don't really want a quarter inch hole at all. What they want to do is to hang up a picture or to have the, the legs stay on the table. So there is always a job to be done that someone's trying to achieve. And to achieve that job to be done, they need some kind of a technology but you know, most of us, I think, unless you're a professional carpenter, you might have a power drill at home and you might have a quarter inch drill, but it probably sits in the cupboard in the bomb shelter 
you know, not being used for most of the time. We don't really want technologies. We want the benefits they bring. I remember horrifying some colleagues at Singtel once when I was running an innovation project for them. I was saying, look, nobody wants your set-top boxes. Nobody wants your fiber optic cables into the home. What they want is to watch movies. What they want is to understand if their grandmother's safe at home. What they want to know is, is their kid safe after they've got sick at school? Those are the things that communicate, telecommunications makes possible. The technology itself is, at the end of the day, just a means to an end. I think that's terribly unfair because I know from having been a practicing engineer and having worked alongside technologists for 30 years, I know how challenging and difficult and underappreciated technology is. But the sad truth is that ultimately we are building businesses if we're doing ventures. We're not doing science projects. It isn't about the papers. So that may be true at the end of the journey, but of course it's not true at the start for a deep technology startup. At the very beginning of the journey for a deep technology startup, the technology is everything. If it doesn't work, then you've got nothing. What I'm going to suggest is, even if it feels like it's everything, you don't let it be everything. Make sure that you're building space to explore the investment readiness alongside the technology readiness, understanding that eventually the technology readiness needs to be there. You need to be carrying on doing research to stay current, to make sure that whatever you're producing is, is relevant to the market and stays ahead of the competition. However, as a business grows, the commercial issues will come to dominate and that's just natural. So taking the big picture view, good marketing is really important because it can reduce the chances of you failing and it can also get you faster to the next stage in the race. So what is marketing? I haven't actually given you a definition of it yet. I put this sort of loose kind of bag around these things that were not really to do with technology, but were to do with desirability and viability. Now, often if you do a business course, you'll be told that these are the four P's of marketing. The thing that you launch, you need to understand these kinds of characteristics about the product. And I apologize that the writing is so small on this slide, um, but the slides are available afterwards for anyone who wants them. The kind of things that you look at with the product itself is what features does it offer to customers? You know, where will the customer use it? Is it something you use in the bath? Is it something you use in the kitchen? Is it something you use with friends? Um, is it different because it's a different color, because it's faster? What is it? You know, do I trust the brand that it's coming from? How is it different from what's already available? How do I pay for it? That's not just about the quantum of how much money I pay for it. Is it something that I subscribe to? Is it something that I buy outright? Now, I think there's an interesting discussion here in the mobility field, for example. You know, the, the, log the thing we've all grown up with since the birth of the motor car is the idea that we might own motor cars, but traditional petrol or diesel powered cars are something that you own. And of course, that's slightly ridiculous. They sit there for, I think, 94% of the time not being used, even though they cost a huge amount of money with all the COE and everything else. The model for electric vehicles for the future might be a sharing kind of model where we have subscribed to a transport service instead of actually owning the product itself. Another issue is where is the product or service available to people? Is it something that you buy at a retail store? Is it something that you order online? Is it something that you consume or experience using your mobile phone? Is it something that comes free with a packet of rice? Is it something that uh, you're typically given as a gift by somebody else? Is it something that uh, you buy when you're on holiday? Where would you come across this thing? And how are you going to make people aware of this thing that exists at all, why they should buy it, how they should connect with it? Who could work with you to get this thing to the people who would benefit from it? So those are all the kind of typical four P's of marketing that you'd learn in a business school. What I'm gonna suggest is that those are absolutely correct, but they're only part of the story. And that's because I think if you're a deep technology business, there are really four different kind of audiences that you have to connect with. Of course, there are the customers, and there might be people between you and the customer. There might be a distributor. So for example, if you're going to launch a artificial meat product into supermarkets, the supermarket is going to be the distribution channel. You're probably not going to sell direct to customers. I mean, there are things like farm shops where you buy you know, direct from the farmer, but I don't think that's gonna be the case for shop meat or, or one of the other um, you know, artificial meat companies. So somehow or other, you have to tell a story that appeals to customers and partners. To scale up the business, you can grow organically, as they say, just using your own funding and the revenue that you bring in, but probably you're going to have to connect with money people. Um, and you're definitely going to have to attract the deep technology company, talented people. You're going to need specialists, 
technical specialist probably to scale up your business. And finally, there's a bunch of people out there who aren't necessarily customers or anything else, but they're people who can stop you doing something like regulators, or they're people who can be champions for you and support you in some way. So again, for example, thinking of the example of say artificial meat, you might have a bunch of vegetarians who don't necessarily want to consume uh, artificial meat itself. However, if it reduces the carbon footprint from keeping cows or whatever, then they might be on your side. So each of those different groups of stakeholders is looking something for something different from your product. Those four P's that I outlined, the four P's of marketing are the kind of thing that consumers and, and partners are going to be looking for. From an investor's point of view, they're not investing in the product, they're investing in a company that makes the product and perhaps other products too. So they're interested in the profit potential. They're interested in knowing that you've got a machine that churns out more money than they put in. They want to put money into your business. They want to lend you money or invest money. And they want to see that money coming back with more. If you're taking on talented people, they want a future career opportunity. And, and the public wants to at least know that you're okay. It's fantastic if you can get the public and all these people to be champions for you and really promote what you're doing, but you certainly want them not stopping you. So some of the things you might do, especially if you're a B2B business, a business to business venture, something that's selling to other businesses, these are some of the tools that you might use in order to connect with those kinds of groups. There are many more, but I just put those up there as an illustration. And the kind of people who might actually deliver those things for you are going to be creative people. They're going to be people that are copywriters, are photographers or illustrators. They're going to be packaging designers. They're going to be people that dress up as monkeys and appear in a supermarket and perform an amazing show about artificial meat for children. They're going to be people that make explainer videos for you, that kind of people. Those are the people that you need to do to do your marketing when you figure out what it is. But as someone who's worked with creative people for 30 years, I can tell you that the wonderful, wonderful as creative people are, they're not the most organized people in the world by and large. So around them, you need producers, you need people who are going to organize them, schedule them, make sure that the thing gets completed on time, that the money is spent wisely, all the rest of it. So around creative people, there's typically a ring of creative production and production management. And then I've gone the wrong way. Around that, creative producers need a brief. If you're a producer and you're used to working with illustrators or animators, you don't know anything about artificial meat. You might have some opinions about it yourself, but you don't know anything about it. And you certainly don't necessarily understand the commercial strategy of a company which is trying to compete in a field that's never been explored before. So there is a whole role for someone to put together strategy around the messaging that needs to be created. So in order to craft a marketing plan and to execute it for a scale up, you really need to figure out the strategy, you need to figure out a brief so that someone can go and execute something, and then someone's actually got to supervise the execution to have it done. I think those, and it seems very complicated when you plot it like that, and it is, and I think that's one of the reasons why often when deep technology folk try to work with for example, creative agencies or advertising agencies, they sort of think to themselves, well, who are all these people? What are they doing? Is it really necessary? Now, if you can do the construction of a brief, if you can manage creative people, you can hire creatives yourself. But most of the time, someone actually got to do that as a human role. So just bear that in mind when you're putting together a marketing plan for a deep technology startup. Don't be caught out by the Dunning-Kruger effect. Don't imagine that these tasks are easy they may be of a different quality to the kind of work that you're doing, but they're just as challenging in a different way. So let's move on to how you might start in practice to put together a marketing plan for a scale up business. We're going to send to you after this a downloadable marketing action plan template. It's purely a draft. It's purely something to get you started. Please make it your own. Don't use it if you don't want to. If you do want to use it, add things, take things out. The important thing is that you express your ideas for it. It's just a template to get you started. Broadly speaking, these are the sections of it. And I'm going to just run through them very quickly so that you'll have some sense of what's there for um, when that lands on your desk. The first thing that we've asked you to do is to explain what your company does in a short number of words. And this, this format comes from a man called Adeo Resi at a thing called the Founders Institute, which is a mentoring organization that runs all around the world with tens of thousands of startup companies. And I think it's an excellent way to begin articulating what a business is. Now, 
I've written down here, I've got to, I thought I'd run through an example for a business that I'm working on at the moment. Um, when I was in quarantine for COVID-19, I realized that cross-border travel was going to be a huge challenge. So I put together a business called Truscan. It's a for-profit company based here in Singapore. In physical terms, it's an online platform and a mobile-based digital app. What does it do? It helps cross-border passengers and these, these different stakeholders to figure out what they have to do to travel safely with COVID-19 and make sure that they're doing it safely. The result of doing that is that they get to be where they're expecting to be on time and that all the people who are carrying them there, the airports and the airlines, can, can work with them um, uh, profitably again. And the secret source that goes into that, the thing that's unique about that is a proprietary database and a whole series of relationships that make accreditation, notification and compliance tracking possible so that we can register, has someone had the right COVID-19 test for the place that they're trying to visit? Is it still valid? Was it done by a competent person? So the first thing we've asked you to do in your marketing action plan is to express your business in these terms. And I'll warn you before you start that it looks easy and it's actually extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My top tip for doing it is to try and do it with someone who knows nothing about your business. Find an intern that you're just bringing in and try and explain it to the intern. Something like that. Go through until you've got a description that's a maximum this kind of number of words. So that's a description of that business. Next, we've asked you to describe how does your business work and what are its strengths and weaknesses at the moment. For those of you not familiar with a SWOT analysis, it's a, a very simple way of saying where is my business at at the moment. Internally, what are its strengths and weaknesses and looking from the outside, where is it at? And when you fill in those boxes, I suggest doing that on something like a three-year horizon because it's very hard to do it beyond that. Now, we've just got a few minutes here. I think when we've got time to look at a business model canvas, I don't know how many people are familiar with the concept of a business model canvas, but it, um, in many ways, you could say that marketing is about making a business model canvas work. It's about making the parts of the business come together. So I thought it was worth trying to show you um, a little animation on this in case you haven't seen it before. Now, I'm just going to ask Susan, if you can't hear the sound from this when I play the video, do let me know and we'll find another way of doing it. An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design, and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. The channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself, nor you perform all key activities. Then once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives.
Hi, Hugh. I think you are on mute. So. Thank you, Susan. Yes, yeah, so I was saying, I think what's interesting about the business model canvas is that it's in many ways, it's a bit like an abstract for a scientific paper. And when, when, if any of us picks up a paper, you expect to see at the top an abstract. You expect the abstract to explain what were the objectives of this research? What was the methods used? Um, who were the test subjects? Um, what were the results obtained? Some kind of discussion and some kind of conclusion. We expect that to come at the top of every scientific paper that we read. The business model canvas is rather like that. It's a kind of abstract for a business that explains it in one page. It's a snapshot of the business now and it evolves over time. I won't play this second video, but it'll be here in the, uh, in the PDF if you, if you get that by email um, and it takes you through in more detail how to start filling out a business model canvas. Um, so, whoops. We've also asked you to start expressing who are you trying to sell to, what, how, what's the size of the market that you're trying to address, and which industries are you trying to move into. Often when we're launching a new deep, deep technology product, there are many different industries we could sell it into. There are often different applications for deep technology products, but which ones are we starting with? And then for each of those industries, what political, economic, social, technological, environmental, and legal factors are going to affect that industry over the next three to five years? So you'll find those boxes in the template also. <clears throat> We've asked you to describe who are your customers. And the critical thing here is that you don't write down generalities like universities. You need to say the um, alumni development officer who goes to find, um, who tries to create revenue from the alumni of the university. We need to identify exactly who it is that you'd pick up the phone and try and call if you were trying to sell to. We've asked you to outline what would be the kind of marketing messages that you might want to use with each of those groups of people, focusing on customers, but starting to think about other people as well. And we've asked you to start thinking about which kinds of channels to market. How are you communicating with people at the moment? Are you attending and speaking at conferences? Obviously, you'll have a website, I'm sure. You might be exhibiting at trade shows. You might be doing roundtable events or talking directly with customers, and you might be getting comments about your business or your technology in industry blogs. Which of those things are you using? Are there other channels that you're exploring? And you might have initiatives that you're putting together from a business perspective around marketing. For example, you might be developing a lot of content. You might be writing white papers to explain your technology. And one of the most useful things I think often that uh, startups and scale-ups can do when they become experts in the field is to write white papers that share the insights they've got with the front line with their own customers. If you can build a community around your customers and share with them the insights that you're finding, you can draw people into a funnel of engagement with you like this where they generate revenue for you and at the same time they draw in other people, they refer other people back into the funnel. And finally, the last stage of that template is a, is a, indicates some kind of budget allocation. We suggest that you start thinking about if you're going to do this marketing, are you going to do all of it in-house? Will you do the strategy in-house or do you need a consultant to work with you on that? If you're going to create stuff like a website or, or uh, white papers with, with, with information, are you going to do that in-house? Perhaps you do some of the writing yourself. Um, maybe you supervise an external writer, somebody on Upwork to do the writing. Maybe you hire in um, a PhD who needs some money while they're still studying, something like that. So think through where would you get the resources required to execute your marketing. The one thing I'd be wary of is being conned by <laughs> all the companies out there who tell you that, oh, you don't need any of that. Technology can solve all of those problems. I think it's very common if we're deep technologists to believe that you know, the, the answer is a technical fix all of these wonderful technologies are great when they're part of the strategy, but unless you've figured out who you're trying to reach, who you're trying to connect with, then all the technology in the world won't achieve the result that you're trying to achieve. It just, it'll just create revenue for a, for a marketing startup. So that's pretty much the end of my presentation now. I wanted to say that there are some books that I found useful, and I hope you would too, that, uh, that, that you could look at if you wanted in some more detail. There's a huge amount of information available online. Um, I'll ask for Susan and uh, CI to follow up by email to suggest some of the uh, other programs of training and support that we offer uh, that might be relevant to you. But most of all, I wanted to invite you into a dialogue to try and address some of these issues. I mean, in one hour, which is what I've been talking to you for now, we've really only been able to touch on what marketing is and how it connects with deep tech startups. We won't solve these challenges 
in one, one hour. It needs a dialogue. So please, as we think about the future of, of working together, this isn't just a one-off session. We'd love it if you had a go at that template, but even if you don't have a go at using that template, please do tell us what worked and what didn't, what was useful to you. Um, and if you do complete the template, we'll try to put together folk who are both non-competing and also share the same kinds of needs so that we can run further sessions. So at that point, I'm gonna stop sharing um, and hand back to Susan and um, see there are some questions. So that's very nice. Um, how should we do this, Susan? Um, I believe you can see the questions through the Q&A function, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, so there are three questions there. <laughs> and the hardest one is first, how do I know when I've transitioned from being a startup to a scale up YouTube chief product market fit? That is something that we should probably run a seminar on. Um, it is not a simple question at all. Um, I think the answer is if you're getting consistent sales, consistent revenue, consistent traction for your business, if you're finding that people are picking up the phone, that's an indication that you're approaching product market fit. Um, that's actually a whole hour uh, to discuss that. Sorry that I can't give you a short answer to that. There are criteria that have been suggested. And what I will do is I'll follow up with some links to articles that answer that question. I hesitate to give a short answer because there isn't a simple answer to it. Um, uh, should we approach marketing as educating your customer, especially when the customer doesn't even know that he or she needs our product or solution? I think that's a really interesting question. If you need to educate your customer that they need your solution, maybe you shouldn't be doing the project at all. Think about Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone. Think about the decade or more that he spent tromping around meeting halls in America trying to promote the telephone. Now that's fine, that was his choice, and of course we've all benefited, benefited from the telephone. But if, you've got, if you want to earn a living, if you want to satisfy the requirements of investors, if you want to make impact on the world, then taking years to educate customers is very difficult. And I think there is a real challenge, again, coming back to that sort of Dunning-Kruger effect question. When you've seen further than anyone else, when you're at the far horizon, it's very, very easy to imagine I know the answers and you little people out there should be grateful for my answer. <laughs> but if the person out there isn't asking the question, they're never going to buy from you and you're going to end up frustrated. So by all means, have vision. By all means, look for opportunities. That's vital in innovation. If we don't have that, we'll never move beyond, well, beyond what we already know. But do engage through, with customers through some of those techniques that we were looking at earlier, some of those lean startup methods or design thinking to try and understand where your customers and the other stakeholders are today. Because it's only by bringing them on a journey with you from where they are now to where you might imagine that they want to be that you'll ever make a business work. But do be realistic with yourself. If you're having to do an enormous amount of education about the need for something, then there's a question about whether the product is commercially viable. If you have to do a lot of education about how something works or why it's safe or that kind of, that's, that's fair enough. But if there isn't a fundamental need, then I think that's a problem. So, so I hope that addresses that question. Um, there's one other one here from, uh, shall I move to Matthew's question? Thank you, Matthew Tay. Uh, I'll come back to Deepak's other question in a second. At what point should we transition an idea or prototype out of the lab and into a startup? That's a really good question. I, I, my suggestion is that when you realize that there is a, a need for it, um, there's a process that um, I go through with my colleagues at NUS and the Faculty of Engineering. We have a, a technology to market program uh, 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 called, uh, <laughs> it's gone out of my head, they're all called something similar. It's something like Tech Venture. I will send a link to it. What we do is take technology which is in the lab right now and have a bunch of students who are a postgraduate level do some of the preliminary uh, market research to identify if I've got a technology, where might it apply? Let me give you an example. We had a, uh, a technology recently which um, allowed power to be sent across a skin barrier to an embedded medical device. So if you've got some kind of sensor that's embedded or, or a, um, uh, a pacemaker or something, somebody, you need to send power to it and you also need to extract data, extract data from it. And there was a wireless technology that allowed that to happen across a sterile barrier. This technology had been developed from a neuroscience uh, research perspective. What we started off doing was saying, well, okay, let's look at this technology and let's look at the benefits it offers. So it offers a passive sterile device to be embedded somewhere that's a very challenging environment and for power and data to go to and from it. 
where might that be appropriate, not just in medicine, but in other areas of life? We did a brainstorming exercise to look at other possible technologies and then to research those and say, well, are those industries the ones that we want to start for? Where could we find a so-called beachhead market, something where we could take that technology? So there are, there are programs around to help you do that transition out of the lab. And um, I'm sure we'll be keeping a note of these questions, Susan, so perhaps we can pick up with them and, and follow through on afterwards. Um, let me come on to Dave's uh, question. Generally, the biopharma industry is faced with unmet clinical needs. Demand is known but cannot be met. Yes, um, hence doesn't argue matters as you've discussed about. So I think the issue to there is to think um, perhaps not just about clinical need, but to think about commercial need as well. Because of course, there is commercial, there is clinical need for products, which is um, very difficult to service on a commercial basis. If I have a disease which is devastating to three people in the world every year, even if I've got a solution to that problem, if it's going to cost 10 or 15, 20 million dollars to solve that problem and get a product through register through uh, certification, if I'm an investor in a pharma company, would I invest in that product or would I invest in something that people are going to use all their lives and which will help hundreds of millions of people? So there is a commercial question as well as a clinical question. So I think when you think about the clinical need, clinical need is part of the market need, but it's not the only need because the other stakeholders in the ecosystem around biopharma innovation include investors, they include distributors, they include doctors. I, I, I had the privilege of uh, working as interim CEO for a, a cancer clinic for about nine months recently. I wanted to focus much more on health technologies, and it was fascinating to see the trade-offs there between different stakeholders in the, in the medical industry. There are innovations that could have huge impact, but they need to address multiple stakeholders' needs, so I hope that answers that question. I'll just pick up Deepak's third question. How much of the budget should a startup or scale-up invest into marketing, especially if you're B2B or enterprise? So I think the key thing there is to have a business model that you understand. When you're a startup, you are very much flying a kite to investors and financiers. You're saying, I think I've got an interesting technology. I think it's going to work. Please give me some money so I can explore it. When you go, and that's when if you're raising what they call a seed round for funding, you know, if you're raising a few hundred thousand dollars, maybe up to a million dollars here in Singapore, you can get away with an argument like that. But if you're raising a series A round, if you're starting to raise millions of dollars to scale something up, you need to understand not just the technology, but also the business model. So you ought to be able to say, if I put $100 extra into marketing here, it creates this much extra revenue, traction, whatever benefit out the other end. You need to show a series A investor that you understand the business model as well as the technology and the science. So the answer to your question is, if you're a startup, Marketing is about research. I would put you as much of your budget as you can into understanding your customers because ultimately they're the ones that are going to make your brilliant technology have impact in the world. If you're a scale up, you ought to be able to calculate. You ought to be able to understand if we spend this on X, then Y will happen. And an investor that you pitch to at Series A will be looking for you to have evidence to back up that kind of uh, argument. So I hope that answers that question. Um, Amishi's asked sort of a creative look out, but how do you sync in your marketing with your branding, given where you want to start out, but also cater to general demands? That's a really great question. I think it's, it's really challenging when you're starting out as a startup, when you've got a technology which is still evolving and you're still looking for the beachhead market where it might apply, how can you brand it? Branding is a promise in one sense. You know, if I go to Starbucks, I know what I'm going to get. That's why I go to Starbucks. If I go to Crystal Jade, I know what I'm going to get. That's why I go to Crystal, Crystal Jade. So when I brand a startup, if I don't yet know what the startup's offering, it's extremely hard to choose a meaningful name. It's extremely hard to choose a meaningful uh, graphical representation of what the startup does. It's very hard to tell sort of key stories around the startup because they haven't yet been fully discovered. So I, I think that's a challenge for startups, for scale-ups. It, it should all grow out of the strategy. By the time you get to be a scale-up, when, when you found where your market should be, where you found where you can start growing and getting traction, then build the marketing and the branding around that, bearing in mind the future markets that you might want to that you might want to move into. And sometimes, of course, if you're doing a technology solution that that can apply in several different markets, you might actually sell it under several different brands. It might be, for example, that if you've got a biopharma product that works well for human beings, 
you might give it a different brand for um, agricultural animals uh, because um, human beings don't like the idea that they might be taking the same drug as cows necessarily. So you might give it a different brand name, even though it's basically the same product and it's even having the same effect on, on, the, on an animal's metabolism, for example. So branding, I think, needs to grow out of the promise that you're making to a customer and the other stakeholders, and therefore it needs to grow out of a true understanding of, the, of exactly the market that you're targeting. I hope that answers Amishi's question. Um, Deborah says, should intellectual property creation be a big focus for deep tech startups? Um, generally speaking, um, it, it is important to have something that's protectable. Um, and I think when you think about intellectual property, you might think about patents, you might think about design rights, you might think about copyright in software. There are all sorts of strategies for the sort of tools for protecting those things. Another thing I think is critical to think about, though, also is realistically, are you going to be able to defend those rights? So there's a famous story around um, Sir James Dyson, for example, when he put together the cyclone in the vacuum cleaners for which he's famous. I believe that, was in, in, that, that patent was infringed by a Japanese manufacturer and it cost him an enormous amount of money to prosecute that Japanese manufacturer. He won uh, and ultimately has become a billionaire because of it. But without, a, without basically betting the farm on, on fighting that lawsuit, he, and, and going through all the distraction of fighting that lawsuit, he, you know, he, he wouldn't have been able to defend the patent. So I think one of the other things to think about is sort of an intellectual property strategy, which certainly comes down to identifying where you have intellectual property differentiation, but also thinking ahead in terms of how are we going to defend this? How are we going to leverage this? How are we going to apply it? Because an automatic, automatically spending you know, tens of thousands of dollars very early on, on getting very detailed patents written, on getting everything trademarked. If you talk to lawyers, they'll always tell you this, that you should do these things. Um, and that's because they get paid for doing those things. They're not giving you bad advice. Um, it's a bit like a doctor saying, oh, you should have this surgery, you should have this medicine. Just remember that the doctor's sometimes making profit off selling you that medicine or doing that surgery in the same way a lawyer may be making profit off doing the IP. So they're not giving you insincere advice. It's just that it comes with its own agenda. So think through an IP strategy as well as um, uh, an IP protection strategy and an exploitation strategy, as well as just protecting things. That would be my advice there. So we've come to the end of our questions. Um, I guess uh, if anyone else wants to pop in with something, I'd be delighted to pick it up. If there's something private that you want to raise, um, you've got my email from the presentations. If you'd like to follow up on the actual process of this, I think Susan, are you and CI going to be actually doing the, the follow up with people directly? Yeah, so we will send a post email, um, post event emailer. So we will check in with the participants uh, with some surveys and also follow up on other, the future plans. Very good. Very good. Mm. Well, thank you everybody for listening. Really, really appreciate your time. Um, they're probably closing things from an admin point of view you want to do, Susan. But from me, thank you very much for listening and please do give me feedback. Um, this is the first time I've done this presentation to this audience. So um, it's not going to be right. I'm doing Lean Startup too. I want to iterate. I'd like to learn. So please tell me what I can get right. So thank you, Hugh. And thank you everyone for tuning in to today's session. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, do drop us an email or comment in our Facebook page and we will address them there. So thank you once again and goodbye. Thank you everybody.